very appropriate for the last class of this year when we enter Rosh Hashanah and the time of accepting the yoke of God, coronating God as king, that we focused on accepting the yoke of heaven and why we need to do that and why that transforms our service. And before we begin, I would like to wish everyone to be written and inscribed for a wonderful, sweet, good year. So we are in the middle Towards the beginning, it's a long chapter, but we'll call it in the middle. Chapter 41 of Tanya. Where are we holding in chapter 41? Well, we've concluded 40 chapters. In those 40 chapters, we learned many things that we're not going to talk about now. But what's pertinent to this chapter is we learned a lot about loving God. And that was probably one of the most overarching themes. The entire 40, 40 chapters was how to love God, strategies to love God, more strategies to love God, more strategies to love God. With the basic premise being, this is the whole foundation of Tanya. If you can truly love and fear God, all of your service will naturally, automatically, perfectly flow. If you really love God, you will want to do everything you can to give to him and be with him. And if you really fear God, you will do everything you can to make sure you don't harm that relationship. So if we love and fear truly, then we can fulfill the verse that these entire 53 chapters are based on, how close it is to serve God perfectly. But in the first 40 chapters, we honestly didn't really talk about fear. We spoke about love. Spoke about joy. We primarily spoke about love. And now in chapter 41, after 40 chapters, we say, but fear, and whatever synonym you might want to use for fear nowadays, awe, nullification, respect, that's foundational. That's first. That's primary. That's more important, even though we just spent 40 chapters developing love. And what we're discussing at this moment, what we're about to read right now, is a long for Tanya, very long quotation from the Zohar, the most foundational work of Kabbalah, to prove the Alter Rebbe's point that even for our service in the positive, doing for God, we need fear as well. We need nullification, we need fear, we need awe, we need fear, we need submission, we need fear. All of that is necessary, not only as we thought, to keep from wrong, but also to do right. In chapter four, a long time ago, chapter four of time, the altar of ascent, that love is a foundation for everything you're doing for God and fear, awe, nullification, submission is the foundation for keeping away from everything God said no to, for fulfilling the prohibitions, which makes a lot of sense. It's very logical in our brains. I love, and therefore I want to give to you. I want to do. I love, and therefore I want to be with you. So I'm going to do, because that's why I'm with you. And I fear and am nullified and have awe, and therefore I restrain and subjugate myself and nullify myself and don't do what you don't want. But now the Rebbe is saying, no, it's deeper than that. For every service of God, you have to have this nullification. So the Rebbe said it. We discussed it at length last week, and now we're about to read this long for Tanya, quotation from the Zohar, and we're going to use it as a springboard to explain this point. So we are looking inside, page Nun Zion, page facing 112. We are two, four, five lines from the top of the page, the third word in. Ukumosha Kosov the Zohar, and as it's written in Zohar, Parshas Bahar, fairly unusual that the Rebbe cites where in Zohar, he's quoted. Sometimes he does. There's always a reason. And here we could say Bahar in the mountain. Of course, it's the beginning of a Parsha, but it's alluding to a certain mountain, to Mount Sinai. Bahar Sinai. And that Bahar, Mount Sinai, is almost like alluding to this concept. Because Sinai was a mountain, but it was a mountain of Sinai. A mountain, an expression of self. That's like the love. Sinai, we know, is the smallest of the mountains, the nullification of self. That's like the fear. But it's one entity. It's Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, love, fear combined as one entity. And that's what we're talking about here. And that's why the Rebbe alludes to the citation. Okay, so now this is this long quotation, as is most of Zohar. This is in Aramaic. Hi Savra, 
like that ox, the Yavin Alei Ol Bekad Musei, that they place a yoke on before, preliminarily, first, begin in order, L'Afka Minei, to bring out from him, Tav L'Al Machule, good for the world. So that is a parable, a mushal. What is a parable? Well, if you have an ox, you yoke the ox. And through yoking the ox, there's productivity to the world, right? We can envision the ox and the yoke, if you've ever seen a picture. And as the ox walks with the yoke, earth is turned over, and then one can plant and bring benefit to the world. That's the parable, okay? Very simple parable. Now, the Zohar continues with the nimshal. What does this represent in our reality? The e hai los tachet gabai and Oh, sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I just skipped a line. Hachinami, so too. It's direct levarnash, a person needs. Lekabla ale omacho shamayim bekad muse, hule, to accept upon himself the yoke of heaven initially, before he does anything else. And if he doesn't, it's not going to be found on him. Godliness. Hi, I'll be out in a minute. I'm going down. That is the quote from the Zohar. It might not have seemed so long to you, but Tanya doesn't usually quote at such length. So again, we had a say, Moshal Nimshal, the parable, the storyline, and what it means. The storyline, you have an ox. If you want the ox to be productive, you don't just have the ox tread on the ground of your field and hope that as the ox walks, the earth underneath it is getting broken up and you'll be able to plant. Maybe they did that a long, long time before, but they went to the yoke. So you put the yoke on the ox and as the ox walks through the field that he's led by the farmer through the field, the yoke is turning over the ground. So the ground is getting broken up. So then the farmer can, plant. and it says in the parable in the mush, if you do this, it will be good for the world. Meaning they'll be bountiful produce. The ox is just walking himself without this yoke. Yeah, he's going to turn over some ground. Some ground will get crushed. Some ground will get smashed. And a tighter clod, some will hopefully get broken up. Some won't be affected at all. It's going to be very haphazard and the produce will not be so great. So you have this yoke, modern technological invention of some, I don't know how many thousands of years ago. If you have the yoke, then the ground is getting turned over and there'll be a bountiful crops. That's the parable. That's the storyline. What does it represent? The Zohar says, a human, just like the ox, has to initially place on himself the yoke of accepting the authority of God. And if he doesn't do so, godliness is not going to rest. So it's very straightforward. Except we have a very big question. Why did the Alter Rebbe, who generally quotes as briefly as possible, give us this whole story about an ox and a yoke and production for the world life? What do we care? Meaning a mushal, a parable, a storyline is supposed to make clearer the point. Like it says, King Solomon had to say 3,000 parables to bring us up to understand his wisdom, his deep, deep wisdom, step by step by step, the ladder of 3,000 parables. But this is very straightforward. I don't need a parable. I can tell it to you straight. If you don't accept upon yourself the yoke of heaven, godliness is not going to rest on you. That was really simple. So why did the Alter Rebbe, I'm not going to even question the Zohar, that's a separate level, but why did the Alter Rebbe bother in Tanya to quote that whole introductory parable that seemingly I don't need at all? What we gain from the parable, how we're helped by the story of the ox, is exactly the point we're trying to make here. Fear is not only to prevent sin. It's not only so we refrain from transgression. I'm scared. What could I be scared of? I could be scared of a lot of things. I could very simply be scared of getting whacked, punishment, or I could have much higher levels, awe, a sense of God's reality, not wanting to harm God, not wanting to harm the world, not warm, wanting to cause evil to come in. I have lots of very spiritual levels of awe and fear and submission. But they're all about holding back from the negative. The storyline in the Zohar is pointing out that you need that yoke for productivity. 
when the ox is yoked, it's beneficial for the world. The yoke is not only or even primarily to prevent harm. The yoke is not so bad things don't grow on your ground. It might do that as well. It might chop up any weeds that are flowering. But the main point of the yoke is to turn over the earth so you can plant, so you can have crops. So there can be a bountiful crops, bountiful produce, wonderful now food to feed your slice of humanity. So that shows us that a yoke has to do with creating something positive. We were thinking until chapter 41, or until this point in chapter 41, that the yoke of heaven keeps me from messing up. Messing up means not doing what I should do. Prevents me, forestalls me from transgression, from sin, from doing wrong. Like I learned in chapter four. Remember, we said in chapter four, love, do. Fear, abstain. Love, do God's will, the commandments. Fear, abstain from transgressing God's will, violating the prohibitions. Made a lot of sense to us. It still makes sense to us. But the Rebbe says, as we see from this story of the ox and the yoke, a yoke is not only or primarily as damage control, prohibitions. The yoke is allowing that bountiful produce. So that's what we gain from the quotation. But of course, what we need to understand is, but why? Why, to put it in our words, in our reality, does my love have to be coupled with fear? Do I need both? And precisely again, what am I gaining from the storyline in understanding that I need both? Because by the way, the Reverend told us that. You can say, well, now he's proving it. We don't have to rely on him. We can rely on the czar. But there's something specifically we're gaining from that quote from the czar. What? So we got a lot to unpack. And before we do so, last week we actually had a beautiful discussion and people were really sharing a lot of personal input on their personal dance, the dynamics of love, and fear and love and fear in their own life and in their own relationship with God. So before we move on, how does this resonate with you? Would anyone like to share how she sees the need? Again, we're sharpening what we said last week. Last week we spoke that you need both. You need love and you need fear. Now we're saying, Within the love has to be fear. To do for God, the love motivation, there needs to be that fear component as well. So anyone see this in their life and how they serve their relationship to love and fear, specifically in not just the love gets me to do and the fear gets me to not transgress, but how the fear as well as the love gets me to do for God. Because that's, in essence, the point that I was bringing out here. Any thoughts on that? I I don't, I guess it's a fear, but uh, of doing things right. Not necessarily a fear of, uh, oh, I'm going to be stricken down. Like, let's say I'm, I'm sitting in the chair and I'm thinking, okay, I'll start to daven. But then I remember I should go to the sink and wash with the cup and then daven. And then sometimes I might think, oh, all right, I'll do it. But it feels like a push. But yet sometimes it doesn't. So I I think it's kind of sort of a fear. I hear you. I think that, 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 that that's great. I think that makes a lot of sense. So what Esther is saying is, in her life, she sees the coupling of love and fear within our positive service of God, because the love is motivating her to do for God, and the fear 
sort of gives her the edge that what she's doing should be exactly like his will. Which, which actually makes a lot of sense. Because again, fear is ultimately nullification. So I want to talk to God. I want to talk to you. I love talking to you. It feels great. Oh, wait. But I want to do it the way you want. And that is definitely, as we will hopefully get to today, the fear component within the love, within the positive. It's actually a, a great, great, great example, Esther. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on this as you see it in your life? I, 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 it's interesting that Esther said that because I go through that, but for me, it, I get too neurotic and I just like, I, I sometimes might not do it at all because it's more than just that I have to watch, that I have to do this or that, and I'm tired and I don't know what the right decision is. I just, <laughs> I, just, I hear you. I hear you, Masha. So what you're saying is you have to watch yourself because this could be a healthy, godly emotion, or it could be a sneaky trick of your evil inclination to make you crazy and actually forestall you from doing anything. Right. And you're right. You know, some of us have very holy evil inclinations and they can make you like literally Masha's giving a great example of a very holy evil inclination that. Makes you mishunga, makes you crazy. So in the end, I, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not even going to dive in at all. Sounds crazy, but our evil inclinations are very sneaky and they know how we tick and they know what's going to push us. And yes, she's absolutely right. We do have to watch it and make sure, especially because we're using in our society a very big trigger word, fear. That's why I keep trying to give other synonyms for it. And we have to make sure it's coming from a holy, godly place. Absolutely, I totally accept that. Anyone else? Any other ways you see this in your life? Um, I could share. Ahuva? Hi. Um, so um, I feel like when you're in a relationship, whether it's with Hashem or Lahabda with a person, um, you want you want to it's like you're doing things out of love, but like you also feel you're like like you're doing things because you're afraid to ruin the relationship. Like you it's motivating you because you're, you know what I'm saying? You're afraid to lose Absolutely. what you have. You're like, if I don't, you know, do this, like, I'm afraid, you know, if I don't spend this quality time with the person, we don't, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to know them anymore. If I don't dive in, I, I'm going to, I'm afraid I'm going to lose Hashem's relationship. Uh, who's like, who's uh, Hashem now in my life? Like, it's, you know, I feel distant from them. Like, you don't want to feel distant. So then it motivates you to come close. So I feel like it's it's tempered together so that it's like, yeah, it just works together. But, but I could relate to you, you, what you're <laughs> saying is, is, is so true and so beautiful. And that really is when we were learning the short road of Tanya, chapter 18 through 25, we really developed in a sense this idea that you're saying 100%. The Hoover is like perfectly expressing this idea that, you know, with the, the, the parable of uh, husband and wife or any other significant relationship, that our doing could come from a fear of losing that which we love. So my love is what's motivated me to dive into pray, to serve. But my because I love so much, I fear so much losing that relationship. And that's also motivating me to do it. And you're absolutely right. And that's a beautiful synergy of love and fear. They're 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 dovetailed together because it's it's the the fear is really another dimension of the love. And that's that's really what we touched on. It's not very much developed. It's definitely there within chapters eighteen to twenty five, the short road of Tanya. That what is the fear? The fear is buried within the love. Because if you really love, you really fear losing that relationship. So this is wow. great. This is beautiful. Because this is in your own lives. You're really getting, you got you got it all. The this is all buried there. So let's go back to, does that, wait, someone else have something they would like to add? Anyone else? Okay. So let's. Get back to understanding then, as it's explained, Siddhis, this is based on the Rebbe, why the Alta Rebbe brought that parable of the ox. Why do I need it? Why can't I just have gotten the bottom line, the nimshal, decoded storyline? 
If you don't have the acceptance of the yoke of heaven, godliness will not rest on you. That's the point. Why do we need that? And we said, well, we needed it because the parable really shows that it's about doing for God. The ox is causing productivity in the world. The ox is causing that produce. So when we do the ase, the positive, we need to be yoked. But again, what's going on? In chapter four of Tanya, the altar Rebbe said, love to do, fear to not transgress. So a few things we can understand in this. First of all, we are not, God forbid, negating what we said in chapter four of Tanya. This is the same Alta Rebbe, and we, you know, we're not we're not changing and, and saying it's it's a it's a different script here. But we're talking about different things. In chapter four, when we're talking about the love is the component of the actions for God, which it is. What the love is determining is how much energy you have in your service. To go back like to, to Esther's example of prayer, which Ahuva also mentioned, and Mash also mentioned, it's the very natural place where we think of our emotions for God. The more I love God, the more I'm gonna be excited to pray. The more I'm gonna feel passionate in my prayer. The more I'm gonna to wanna to be meticulous and, and so precise in my words, because I love you, God. I want to connect you with a lot of energy. That's the love factor. But the fear within the positive action is making it service, is making it what we call avoida, service. Because if I just have love, and we're going to explore this in a few minutes, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. But if I just have love, it could be a lot about me, my passion, my excitement, my desire to have this cool, unbelievable relationship with God himself. And the yoke, the nullification, means it's about God. So the service, that is determined by my fear, my nullification, my awe, the excitement is determined by my love. So what the altar I said in chapter four is absolutely true. The more I love, the more I'm going to have this excitement, passion, drive, energy to throw myself into divine service. But I need to have the fear component because I don't want it to be a me trip. I want it to connect me to God. So if we look at this, there are layers and layers of understanding and Hasidic thought. Why? Why do I need that fear to connect to God? And there's, we can share several because there's many different ways of looking at this. A very simple way, but very true. I'll give another parable for this. It's a classical parable, not mine. Is if you have this decrepit hovel and you want to move into it, you're not just going to put in lots of gorgeous furniture. You're going to at the same time clean out the junk. Dust away those cobwebs, wash the windows if there are windows. You're going to clean it to be able to put in this beautiful furniture and it, should, and it should be a wonderful home. So if we just focused, even in the realm of doing for God, if we just focused on I love you so much and I'm giving you and I'm giving you and I'm giving you, there could be a lot of junk going on in our relationship. There'd be a lot of beautiful things. Every commandment is another beautiful piece, beautiful jewelry, beautiful furniture, whatever parable you want to make. But I didn't clean out the garbage. The fear nullifies me. When I nullify my inner junk, the barriers I have inside of myself to God get removed. And then the beauty can shine. So that's a very classical way of understanding how even within love, even within doing, I need that negation of self. Another dimension that's developed a lot in Tanya, a little deeper than that, is that bottom line, nullification is what allows God to rest on us. This is developed extensively all the way in chapter six of Tanya maybe even before in chapter four and definitely in chapter six. 
which means the magnet for God's presence is when you make room for him. So if I take up all the space, it's like God's like, ooh, I guess I wasn't invited to this party. There's no room for me here. That's why it says in the Talmud that if someone has a lot of ego, a lot of sense of self, there's no space for God. He's disinvited because we're not making any room for him. How do I make room for him? When I nullify myself. Nullification is the magnet for God's presence. So imagine this thought. Imagine you love God. You're doing all these things for him, but without nullification. Like I said before, it's a me trip, not a God trip. I feel great when I pray or when I host lots of people, Rosh Hashanah, I want to have so many people at my table. It makes me feel so good. I love giving charity. It makes me feel so good. Now, again, so we're supposed to feel bad when we serve God. It's not supposed to feel good. We have to be very careful that it's coupled. We want to feel good. We want to love. And we will soon read inside this dynamics of the ourselves as God's child, ourselves as God's servant, slave. And we need both. But if we only have that, this feels great and I love serving you this way, I'm not serving you. It's about me. It's about what makes me tick. And that's what makes me feel good. Now, of course, if you were trying to bring someone else close to God, you wouldn't belabor that point. You want them to enjoy it. You want them to see the passion and the good and the joy and the energy and the truth. And of course, and it's all true. That's all part of it. But as you get more refined or sophisticated or advanced in your service of God, you understand that it has to be about him. Well, of course it's about him. This is what he's telling me to do. Maybe, maybe not. Sort of an easy test is, do I also do those things that don't make me feel good? Am I equally invested and passionate in those things that don't resonate, but they're his will? If yes, then probably in the other things you're good as well. So when the Zohar said that very strong sentence, if you do not have this yoke of heaven Godliness will not rest on you. This is chapter six of Tanya. That's what the altar of said there. The magnet for God's presence is nullification to him. And if we're not nullified, he's not resting. So when I'm doing for God, which as we learned in chapter four means I love and I want to connect and I want to give and I want to do and I have passion and excitement and drive. That's all wonderful. But we want preliminary, before we do all that, to stop and nullify ourselves. This is not about me. However exciting it is, if it wasn't about you, God, I'd be doing something else. Maybe I'd be having a dinner party. I don't know, be every Friday night. You know, maybe I'd be... In anything we're doing, if you love learning Tyra, well, you can learn something else and not Tyra. You know, you love hosting, you can host in different ways and not. You know, God, I'm putting those boxes on my door because you want them. I would have no need to put boxes on my door. I'm buying this brand and not that brand because this is your will. So just as it's obvious in certain things in our life that we're only doing it because it's God's will, it has to be obvious in everything. Because we want God to rest in our service. That's why we're doing it. We want him to be part of our service. We want him to be welcomed. We want him to have space. And that's why this parable is very pointed. Because the parable said, preliminarily, before we leave that ox in the field, we put on him a yoke. We don't do it when he's halfway through my field. That would not be beneficial. Before he starts walking in the field, it's yoked. So then the work is productive. So before I start, focus, think, remind yourself of what you know. God, I love you. And I'm doing this because this is your will. 
This is what you want. Because you want it, I want it too. Because you love it, I love it too. But it's about you. It's your will. And that's why I'm doing it. So I'm yoking myself. Initially, I'm subjugating myself. God, this is your will. And then I could do it with all this passion and excitement and joy. Just like the ox. That's a second level of understanding this. But there's even a third dimension here. Because if we're really true to the metaphor, to the parable, it's not only that we yoke the ox, and then as he walks in our field, we slip off the yoke. Well, that wouldn't be very beneficial either. The, for the parable to work, for that ox to be productive and to produce bountiful crops, we yoke him before he starts, like we were just discussing, and we make sure the yoke stays in place for the entire duration when the ox is walking through my field. And that is also very relevant to what we're saying, which is why we need that parable. And we couldn't just have the bottom line decoded storyline. It's not enough to breathe. Remember, this is all about God's will. And then do the commandment and forget about it. That's not what the ox is doing. We don't put the yoke on the ox and then take the yoke off the ox and let him run through your field. For the ox to be productive, he's yoked the entire time. And the altar is quoting that because he wants us to understand that this is true for us as well. For us to be productive, for us to be productive, we can't just have that, you know, like a moment of silence, moment of nullification, and then go on and forget about it. We have to maintain it throughout because we want God to rest on us throughout. So therefore, throughout everything we're doing, we're doing it with love, we're doing it with passion, but it has to be flavored with nullification. So someone just asked if I could review the three levels. So the three levels we're saying here, all of which are true, just getting deeper and deeper of why we need this metaphor and why we need this fear like this. So on the first level, we said the love itself would be like bringing in good, but I didn't take out the garbage. The fear, my fear of God is like cleansing away the junk in my system, primarily the ego in my system, which then allows me to do the commandments and beautify it more and more. So we understand that we need both, because I need to remove the barriers and then the beauty of my commandments can shine. But that's just sort of saying you need both. Deeper than that was the idea, as we see in the story with the ox, that I need to start by yoking my ox. That's what the story says. We first yoke the ox before he does anything for him to be productive, which is telling us that I need to initially subjugate myself to God before I do anything else for his service, before I study or do a commandment, I have to start with subjugating myself because it doesn't work otherwise, because I want God to be within my action. That's why I'm doing this. And God is only found when one is nullified to him, when you make space for him. Nullification means you put yourself aside so there's room for him. So if I don't put myself aside and I have this tremendous love, which is a lot of me, it's great, it's exciting, it feels good, but there's no room for him. So just as in the story, we initially yoke the ox, I initially nullify myself so my service can be about him and God can shine in it. And then the third level we said even more was going back to our story. The, the ox is yoked the entire time. Not just in the beginning. It wouldn't work if you take off the yoke after the beginning. Expressing to me that it's not just have that initial moment, pause, reflection of nullification, and then go, you know, your merry way with a lot of love. Though that's wonderful. But it's not going to keep God present in what you're doing. I need not just in the beginning. I need throughout. Out my service and nullification to God 
to keep it aligned with him, that it's his service. This makes me an eve, a slave, a servant, subject to God. This makes this avoida, service, which it might sound ironic or strange that I could be doing all this stuff for God, but it's about me and it's not about him and I'm not serving him. But it's really painfully true because if I don't taste, if it's not flavor with an nullification, I'm doing what he's saying, but not necessarily about him or to take it on another level to understand this similar, but maybe slightly different angle. The idea of the commandment is a a bridge between me and God. That's actually what commandment means. The Hebrew word for commandment is mitzvah. The etymology of that is safsa, which means a bond. So the goal of every commandment, if I'm lighting my candles for the Shabbos, if I'm eating kosher, if I'm dressing modestly, if I'm refraining from gossip, it's all the same. It's a mitzvah. It's safsa. It's to connect and fuse the two of us. That God's energy shines on me. But the philosophical question is, how is your commandment strong enough to contain God's energy? Or in a sense, who are you that your action is going to house the creator? You're we, I, very finite, God, very infinite, and my action is going to contain him? So that's why we need the nullification. Because if I don't have the nullification, the primary flavor of my action, my service of God, my mitzvah, is me. Love is the expression of me. I love. It's my energy being expressed. So if I'm loving and therefore I'm doing the commandment, the flavor of that action is me. It's creation. It's beautiful that I'm doing something God wants but it's very limited to my limitations. If I nullify myself, if I put myself on the side by very strongly feeling, this is about you. I'm doing this because it's your will. You want this done. And that's the flavor of my service. It's not limited to creation. It's flavored by creator, meaning when you accept upon yourself the yoke of heaven, what's felt in your service is heaven. Not creation, but creator, not you, but God. So if the primary flavor is God, the commandment has the ability to contain him. And that's why, even as we're doing, and we want to do with a lot of love. I'm almost taking it as a given that you're doing with love. We have to work on that as well. But we want to do with a lot of love, and we want to have passion and excitement and joy and pleasure. Of course, we want all that in our service, and we should have all that in our service. And at the same time, the author of is saying, it's a yoke. The yoke can't slip off that ox. If it does, done with the productivity. It's not helping us anymore. We need to keep aligned with nullification. This is about you. This is about your service. This is about your will. That's why this is happening. And then we're freed from the confines of creation and we can contain creator, which is what happens when we serve with the yoke. When we have all that love yoked by all of our submission to God. So these were a lot of different ways of understanding this. And, and of course, there are more and more nuances that you could pull out. Um, the previous law of it, the Rabbi Yad said that it's like when we accept upon the yoke of heaven, it's like we're planting. And the plant can be bountiful crops. And if we don't have that yoke, it's like there's no bounty that's going to come from our service which is in essence saying, because the God factor is not going to be there, as we're saying. So translating this to the practical, does anyone have any thoughts how this would impact her service and what she would do differently because of this? Because this is all supposed to go right back to your own service where the week of Rosh Hashanah, even if we spaced out by now, you might have your fish head or your ram head or your honey or your pomegranates are 
on your kitchen counter. You know, we're, we're, it's very good timing because Rosh Hashanah, of course, is about nullifying ourselves to God, to evoke from God the desire to be our king one more time from a deeper place than ever before. So this is really very, very appropriate for now work. Anyone has thoughts how they would translate this in their own service, what they would do differently or what they could do about this? How would you incorporate this idea that the Alter Rebbe is saying here based on the Zohar, which is without nullification, God's not part of what you're doing. <laughs> you must nullify yourself before you do anything. We yoke that ox before he starts. And the, the ox has to have that yoke firmly in place the entire time for the ultimate productivity. We have to have that nullification and that sense of this is about God throughout our service. So, so he's part of it. So he can rest in it. So his divine energy can shine through what we're doing. Just <clears throat> people, people um, when I was younger would tell me that I was stubborn as an ax. <laughs> you ever hear Not that? a mule. They gave you a kosher animal. You were an ox. And, uh, you know, or, or what, uh, you know, just like only wanting your mind to go your own way in your train of thinking. So I'm thinking now I, I'm, I probably still am uh, somewhat or a lot stubborn that if I could just ha please Hashem harness it in the right way, harness me in the in the right way. Just a little, just a little thought on it. That's beautiful. A lot of work to do, though. Well, I think when we have a vision, we could just keep walking in that direction. If we don't have a vision, you know, we're just, we're like that wandering sheep that's going nowhere. When we have a vision, that's what I want. I want to harness my nature and use it to serve you. Then we take a step and we take another step and we take another step and God, give us enough time. We'll get there. Very, very beautiful. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on that? I think it helps me when I think of human relationships because, you know, you could, I can understand that more tangibly than God. So if I think about the idea of like when you do things that you like for someone, but they don't like it, like it's not their it's not what they want. It's all about you. You give things that you like. You do things that you like. And it's not really thinking of them. And if I think of it in that way, then I could think of when I'm doing things for God, you know, then then I could say, I could understand that if it's only things that I want to do, then it's only about me. But I can, for me, it just helps me to think about human relationships because that I understand better that's all that that's great i think we can all understand that when you're giving a present are you thinking about what you would like or what they would like um you're right you're right and if just i guess you're saying if you're in a delicate relationship with someone you're going to be conscious of that as you're talking or relating interacting with the person you can be conscious it's not about me what works for them and in essence, you're right. That's, that's of course, that is how we understand Hashem. The Pasuk says, From my flesh, I perceive God, which is understood on many levels. Spiritually, the dynamics of our soul is a mirror of Hashem's dynamics. But all of the relationships are definitely mirroring. So 100%, I, I think it's great for us to like say, okay, how does this work in human relationships? And then let me say, I want to incorporate this in my relationship with God. Like the stakes are very high. The altar is giving us very high motivation. If you don't do it this way, godliness is not happening. You know, it's it's not like, oh, come on, give me a little slack, a little wiggle room. Say it's happening less. The altar says, no, no, no. I'm telling you the, the, the blunt truth. The blunt truth is, if you're not nullified, it's not about God. It's about you. If you're not nullified, God says there's no room for me here, even though you're doing a mitzvah. I mean, there are other benefits to doing a mitzvah, so keep doing the good. God willing, you'll get to the 
deeper level, but why wait? You know, we want God in everything we do. And I think maybe, maybe a, a practical thing, you could start with commandments that are hard for you, positives, things we do, but things we do that, that, that maybe you struggle a little with. Like Esther said before about washing the hands or whatever. And in those situations, because it might be easier in those situations, to have this thought of like, God, you know I don't want to do this, but it's your will. That's why I'm doing it. And make that like a constant refrain in your thoughts. I don't want to dress like this, but it's your will. So I'm doing it. Maybe even because it's your will, I'm even liking it. But it's, it's, if it wasn't for your will, I would not be dressing like this. I don't want to do this. Whatever. You know, this, we can all think of many things. Why am I doing this, God? Because it's your will. And the more we think of that, the more we realize our whole life is because it's your will. And the more we tell ourselves that again and again and again, we're strengthening that muscle in our brain. So it becomes very natural. It's a natural refrain as we tick, as we move, as we think, this is about you. This is your will. This is for you. This isn't for me. What would I do this for? It's not on my list, but this is your will. This is why I'm doing it. And when you, build, when you build that up in the, in the, in those things that are more natural to think that because they're, they're more difficult for you. When that thought becomes strong enough, you can also extend it to things that you really have lots of love for. But Rabbit said, isn't it obvious that we do this because God wants us to do? I don't when I don't want to wear socks in the summer. <laughs> I do it because God wants to. You know, I think anything that I mean, there are things that I really they like not doing, but I'm doing it because God wants me to. All right? True. But if we don't think the thought, it's there subliminally. It's there in a very soft key. When we okay. think it, we make it very strong. Because also, for most of us, not for all of us, it depends on how much you don't want it. But let's say you wouldn't cover your legs in the summer. You would walk around with flip-flops and be so happy and breathe. But God wants your legs covered. So maybe when you made that initial commitment, there was a lot of struggle. And you had to really like, you know, submit to God's authority. But if yeah. you've been doing it for 10 years, maybe by now, even though buried within it is this like, I, why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this because of God. But if you've been doing it for 10 years, you probably just, do it. You know why if someone asked you, but you're yeah. not really operating on that level anymore. Yeah, well, now now, now it's like I would not not do it. <laughs> it just like, become part of me. I wouldn't even go downstairs with, you know, to the mail room with, with no socks on. So, yeah. Exactly. And it that's become beautiful. Part of you. And that's good. That's not bad. That's not like, oh, shocks, you know, we'd rather. If... No, of course, that's beautiful. That means you've integrated it. It's become part of you. But at that same time, you lost a little focus from the fact, which is still the core truth, that you're doing this because this is God's will. So what we're saying is not like, you, like you're giving exactly what I'm saying. Take an example of something you're only doing because of God and you really don't like doing if you allow yourself to think about it, which you don't at this point because you've done it so long. You're not a teenager. You know, you're not a young child. You've trained yourself to do this and you do it. And it's you when you've moved on and maybe you've refined yourself and maybe now you have an appreciation for it. And maybe now you actually see this as much more appropriate and befitting. Hopefully, hopefully that's what happens. But still the core is, God, this is your will. So when you think that thought, God, this is your will, that's why I'm doing this, what you're in essence doing is taking that core and letting it shine. So we have like a synergy of the freshness and newness and like challenge of, I don't want to do this, but it's your will, with 
the beauty of internalizing and the shift that's happened to you because by now God's will has become your will. Meaning every time you do a commandment long enough, hopefully, like Rachel just said, with covering her legs, that becomes you, which means you changed, which means you shifted, which means you became more godlike. If you wouldn't dream of talking about someone else, you became more godlike. If you wouldn't dream in your thoughts of using inappropriate language, you became more godlike. The Rebbe gives a beautiful metaphor for this concept. The Rebbe says that if someone's a silversmith, what a, when, uh, when a silversmith gets a lump of silver, the silver has a lot of imperfections in it. Alloys, imperfections. So what does the silversmith do? He puts the silver in the fire. And what he's doing is burning out the impurities so that all that's left when he takes that out of the fire is pure silver. But it's a very delicate work because if you don't leave it in the fire long enough, it's going to have impurities. If you leave it in the fire too much, you're going to ruin it. So you want to take it out exactly at that point where it's completely pure. How does the silversmith know? So the Rebbe says, as the silversmith is stirring his pot of silver, he's looking in the silver. He's looking in the silver. And when he sees his face reflected in the silver, it became a mirror. He knows it's absolutely pure and he pulls it out of the fire. And the Rebbe says, that's God and us. God's clearly the silversmith. We're clearly the silver. We come into this world with lots of impurities. And as we're in the fire of this world and the fire of life, there's lots of fires. We all know that we're serving. And as we serve, we become more and more refined, godly. So, so to speak, when God looks at us, what's reflecting off of our face is his. When the face of God is reflected in the face of man, that's when the silver has been purified. That's when we're pulled out of the fires. And that's what happens. So as we serve, I don't want to do this, but I'm doing it because it's your will. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Oh, okay, well, I'm doing it. Okay. Hey, I actually like it. Hey, I, I sort of see the benefit. Hey, it's a nice thing to do. Because I changed. Because I shifted. Because my impurities got burnt away. So what's shining through me is God. But even at that point, we don't want to lose the advantage but the only reason I'm doing this is because it's your will. That's my initial point. And when I think about it, I more feel it and it more fills what I'm doing with God's space.